Right, so I'd like to welcome you all to our fifth webinar in our eight part series where we're looking at how we're going to digitize payments in South Africa, specifically focusing on government to person payments and person to government payments, but more broadly actually on the digitization of payments for South Africa. Um, a lot of this work has been sparked by the um, presidential employment stimulus. And as you know, that this intervention is actually run by the private office, um, the, pro the, private, the project management office in the private office of the president. Um, and for those of you that don't know that are new to the webinar series, a lot of our journey started when COVID hit and we had to figure out how we were going to pay um, millions of South Africans who weren't on our system through the SRD 350 grant. But more importantly, we hit a lot of challenges when we started to roll out the presidential employment stimulus. Uh, where we were trying to roll out uh, various stipends or support to um, persons uh, or citizens. And we hit quite a few snags. And so we realized there's such an importance on trying to focus on the digitization of payments. Um, it's important to note that we've got three more webinars coming. Um, so if you can please just keep a lookout on the emails that are coming to you from Carla specifically. Um, an exciting one actually is the FinTech Hackathon, which is happening on the 1st of December, where we've got a whole lot of FinTech companies and we're presenting some innovative ideas on payments. And the payment series actually finishes on the 15th of December, which will be our last webinar series. With that, I'd like to present, oh, so just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover today, we're actually going to hear from uh, Mr. Kuram Farouk from the World Bank, who's going to discuss governance issues for G2P payments, specifically in the, in the public sector, because we're focusing on the digitization of payments in the public sector today. Uh, we then are going to listen to Portia Matsena, who used to be uh, in the Office of the Accountant General, if I'm not mistaken, Portia, and is now the CIO at Bank Serve Africa and she's going to look at G2P and P2G digitization of the public sector. Then Will Cook from CGAP will be presenting on some of the fees and incentives in social protection fund disbursements. And then Mr. Carl Kaprinski is going to be presenting some case studies on Bangladesh and Poland. And then in the last 30 minutes, we've actually got a panel of experts. We've got Andrew Donaldson, who used to be the DG, DDG at the Treasury of Public Finance and the Budget Office. Uh, we've also got Mr. Duresh Ramklas, who is actually at GTAC with us. We've got um, Mr. Ishmael Mamaji, who was the ex-accountant general at the Treasury as well. And then we've got our guest speakers with us. So with that, um, Kuram, I'm going to hand over to you um, so that pe people can actually see a little bit of your bio while you have time to actually upload your slides. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can, loud and clear. Yes. So thank you, colleagues. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining. So agenda is, uh, I will just share some of the key messages uh, and the, some of the basic principles. Uh, the focus of my discussion, as Kathy mentioned, is on the G2P, so the government to person payment, especially from the governance issues uh, rather than technology issues. Uh, and then uh, one important aspect is the compliance of the G2P framework with the budgetary and overall public financial management systems. Uh, and then uh, and further elaboration of this concept uh, will be done through how the G2P payments can integrate with the treasury control, especially treasury control over cash. Uh, and then I will share with you a holistic view of the G2P building blocks that the World Bank has uh, constructed as part of our G2P overall framework. And then some other governance issues relate to the dupli duplicative investments. So what are the key issues and how to address those issues? So PFM and governance, a budgetary provision and compliance with the budget is very, very important. We have seen in many countries that the G2P programs are off budget. So they are donor funded projects, which are separate. And uh, so uh, it is important that the G2P programs are on the budget and they go through the budgetary compliance procedures. And similarly, the treasury control over cash. 
uh, through the trade single account and through IFMES is also very important. We have also seen that many G2P programs, they process their payments and uh, but they draw the money outside the uh, from the trade single account in a commercial bank account so uh, and this is a concept i will elaborate further in my next slides institutional coordinator uh, coordination arrangements are also very very important g2p is not a standalone program there are several agencies involved so we'll talk a little bit of that and institutional coordination mechanisms are important uh, and as i mentioned holistic view of the g2p system there is a slide on that and uh, one important aspect that we are seeing more and more in many countries is the use of disruptive technologies just like artificial intelligence, uh, big data, and other technologies that can enhance efficiencies. And again, uh, our audit, uh, audit should, uh, internal audit and external oversight uh, should be planned and well coordinated. It should not be an afterthought. So, uh, what do we mean when we say the G2P payment program should comply with the budget systems? So as I mentioned, uh, are they on budget? Are they donor funded programs which are off budget? Uh, and then we have also seen that uh, even if, if they are on the budget, sometimes uh, the predictability of the, the cash is not there. So you have one uh, release for some program and then you run short of money and then you do not have a consistent and predictable uh, release of budget. Uh, uh, so active cash planning rather than cash rationing is very important. Uh, and then again, the two payments should be routed through IFMIS, uh, not separate from IFMIS. It will help you in many, uh, in not only budgetary compliance, but also uh, the integrate with the treasury uh, sing, single account. So this is uh, this is how what, what I, I want to explain the concept. If you look, this is the top red boxes are the, actually the flow. So there are ministries and departments which run their G2P programs. It could be a social protection payment system. It could be a pension system. It could be a payroll system also. And then there could be many others, but this is just a sample. And then uh, when you run your payment uh, processing, then uh, instead of sending the payment advice uh, directly to the, the payment service providers, uh, what we, uh, which, is, which is the case in many countries, by the way. So what we advise is that uh, the lump sum payment, let's say you have run a social protection payment for 200,000 beneficiaries. So the lump sum payment of the 200,000 beneficiaries, that payment request should be routed through IFMIS so that it integrates with the budget. Uh, the, the central folks can check whether it complies with the budget release. And then it can also integrate with the trade single account and then send the instruction to the central bank where your trade single account is so that they can move the money uh, from the trade single account uh, to whatever uh, the whatever uh, is a distribution amongst various uh, payment service providers. Uh, and the detail, the retail, what is the breakup of those uh, 200,000 employees or the beneficiaries that can be sent directly to the payment service providers. Uh, and then they can match what they have received uh, uh, or it can be sent uh, through a central portal or it's through the central bank. There are various arrangements in various countries, but this is uh, the important thing is to understand is so it should be integrated with the IFMIS and Trady, uh, Trady single account. Uh, this is a holistic view. Uh, this is the World Bank, uh, the G2P program they have built. So there are three main pillars, interoperability and share infrastructure. It gives you a broad picture of the overall uh, uh, landscape. So you have ID systems where you, uh, you, uh, you can check the identification and do the authentication. And then there are social registry. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are payroll uh, management programs and there are several other programs. And then you can have a common account directory. Every, uh, every payment program uh, maps uh, your beneficiary uh, or the payee with the bank account or the mobile account or whatever. So you can have a common account directory uh, and then uh, that can be used by various programs. Uh, similarly, as I mentioned, PFM and central treasury systems, the national payment systems and connectivity. And the second pillar is enablers. Uh, so you have bank and non PSPs, you have distribution networks and access points. Access points are your, it could be a shopping mall, it could be an ATM, it could be 
uh, any any um, uh, outlet. And then the payments, payment acceptance networks and accounts and payment instruments. Uh, I think we have some colleagues from the private banking sector. They, they, they can talk more about it. Inclusion and empowerment. This is very important, actually. For example, gender. You know, any payment program should be able to track the gender uh, so that you we have data on how we are doing on the gender. Similarly, data protection and cybersecurity is extremely important. Uh, and recipient protection and grievous redressal. This gives the citizen the mechanism to respond and uh, register their grievances. And obviously communication and literacy is also very important. So you, this is just a snapshot of the two of the, there are a lot of emerging technologies that are being used by various countries, but I will just give you two examples. One on the example on the left is a payment portal. So, uh, so payment portal is a central place uh, where you can map all the beneficiaries uh, to their uh, to their bank accounts or to their mobile accounts or to whatever, and then uh, you can centralize the payment instructions. So instead of each and every uh, uh, payment program, a like social protection pro program or a pension or a payroll program sending payment instructions directly to the central bank through various electronic fund transfer mechanisms. You can centralize this through a payment central portal. Uh, so instead of each and every uh, program developing their own interfaces, their own security credentials and, their, uh, and doing their own separate mapping, you can centralize all this into a cent through a, a central portal. And the central portal, through the central portal, then you can send the lump sum payment instructions to the IFMIS uh, and then retail payment instruction to instructions to the various commercial banks. And then through the IFMIS, you can send the, as I explained, the lump sum payment advice to the central bank to move the money from the treasury single account. On the right is again the use of big data, satellite and artificial intelligence is again very big. One example is the micro data on the cellular usage. So the typically the poor people has a very a pattern of cell usage. The call duration is very short. Uh, they don't have a very large amounts of uh, top ups on their mobile and they don't have a lot of overseas calls. So using uh, that cellular data from the mobile service providers, you can validate and authenticate the eligibility of uh, it's an additional check because we have seen in some examples in some countries there are fraud, there are people who are rich or who are relatives or party workers and who, who don't deserve to be on the beneficiary list, but they are on the list. So there are, there are validation mechanisms. Uh, you can reconcile the data with different sources of information to enhance integrity of the system. Uh, again, the institutional coordination, one of the biggest challenge that we have seen is not technology, but institutional coordination. And we have seen a lot of duplicative investments. So improved coordination can save millions. For example, every G2P social welfare program has to interact uh, with digital ID. They have to do that identification, they have to do the authentication, and they have to have some mechanism of eligibility determination. So the question is, are these duplicative? Uh, similarly, as I mentioned earlier on the, digit, uh, the payment portal slide, then every program might have electronic fund transfer, EFT, or interface with the bank. So uh, can there be a centralized EFT uh, through the portal? Uh, to avoid duplicative investments. Uh, similarly, interfaces that they've missed at Treasury, again, through the portal, you can avoid multiple interfaces uh, and avoid duplications. Uh, account mapping, every uh, payment program has an account mapping, as I explained earlier. The beneficiary is mapped with a bank account or the telecom or whatever they have. So can, instead of having this account mapping uh, duplicative, in every system, can we have a central account mapper? And again, the payment portal can uh, provide that facility. But in India, they have a separate account mapping app uh, where there is a centralized mapping. It is used by the various programs. 
Uh, again, payment processing systems for each program and agency could be duplicative. Citizen feedback, SMS-based infrastructure. Every uh, program should have some element of citizen feedback. Uh, but uh, the question is whether uh, these are standalone uh, investments, siloed investments, or you can have a common SMS-based infrastructure that can be used by all the programs to avoid duplications. Bank reconciliation and payment confirmation to beneficiary is again important. And again, that can be also uh, seen whether it is duplicative or you can centralize it. Data standards and governance. There should be a central agency and uh, for monitoring and, uh, and ensuring compliance with the data standards and governance. Uh, so that is another area. Last but not the least, data centers. Uh, these days, cloud offers immense opportunity to save cost. Uh, and then there are mechanisms for having framework contracts with the cloud service providers. So you have immense opportunity to reduce the uh, data centers and move your data in the cloud without compromising the security and sovereignty of the data. So center coordination, what are the various mechanisms of center coordination? So central coordination at the governance level in Austria, for example, in the US, there is a CIO council where all the CIOs of the various agencies meet regularly to ensure that there's no duplication and they coordinate. Similarly, in Austria, there is a CIO board. Uh, and then the second point is very important, which is the role of a central agency. Now, <laughs> The central agency, often people ask me this question, where should this central agency located? Uh, the simple answer is that it should be located where it should have the convening power. So when it has convening power, then it can ensure better uh, coordination. So typically in most of the OECD countries, for example, the central agency is either under the office of the president, prime minister, cabinet, or ministry of finance. Similarly, framework contracts for our crowd service providers can avoid piecemeal procurements of cloud, update procurement regulations to promote reuse of licenses. In US, there is a law that says that if government has a license, uh, the other entities should reuse the same license rather than procuring it separately. Uh, again, uh, single portal uh, for public service delivery, every agency should not have their own portal to, uh, to expose their services. The concept of a single portal is very powerful. And then whole other government standards on cybersecurity, privacy, and data governance can be instituted uh, and institutional coordination with the agency for IT, treasury, budget, and subnational governments is also very important aspect of the institutional coordination. So this is my last slide, taking action. Uh, these principles are many, uh, but to summarize, uh, I think uh, the government can uh, have a governance and institutional review. Uh, and the second is that uh, we can have a architecture review of the G2P and the broader digital services landscape uh, if the government thinks that there are duplicate investments and there are fragmentation and silos. And again, the data governance is very, very important. Uh, data governance is a specialized field and there are methodologies for that. So that would also be done. Thank you very much for your attention. I will stop now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karam. That was actually very interesting. And certainly you've asked one of my very burning questions, which is uh, where should you actually locate the uh, central agency? So um, it's one of the questions I was going to ask later, but you seem to have asked, uh, answered it already. So thank you very much for that and uh, for some of your wonderful insights on that. Um, I'm going to hand over to um, Portia, who's going to take us through um, to the next sort of set of presentations. Portia is actually CIO at BankServe and has spent quite a few years in the public sector and is actually very passionate about this. So we're very excited to have you with us, Portia. Thank you, Kathy. Let me share my presentation. Thank you um, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm humbled and honored to be representing Bank of Africa, also speaking from and, and my understanding of government. And we're talking about collaboration. I'm glad I'm speaking after Mr. Kuram, after he's painted a picture of how we should be 
uh, integrating with each other and also painting a picture of the various initiatives that are within the government sectors and within the other entities. And I'm going to be taking you um, into a journey that starts from cradle to grave so that we understand why we need to partner and why eventually we get to digitization of payments and why should we digitize. But prior we even get to the payment, payment is the last element of us having to even address most of the issues. We need to understand where does it start? And hence my journey is starting from cradle to grave, understanding where government is. And when we start government, we talk about procurement, you know, to say this is where it starts. Where does it start? We look into what is it that government wanted to, to do uh, in terms of digitizing the procurement space, also eventually coming into the payment center. We have seen initiatives, we've had people speak about how they would want to respond to the government initiatives. But how we respond, we need to understand the various initiatives that are within the government sector. So now government came and, and especially being headed from the national treasury to say, we need to digitize the private sector and how do we digitize it? And they looked at the reforms that they needed to address, especially in the procurement space, to say for us to be able to eventually get to a point where payment becomes seamless. Let's start with our, our processes within, which is a procurement, procurement which leads eventually to a payment being made. And where does it come from? We all know we all exercise our rights. We've seen what is happening within the industry. And we know that we are audited by the Auditor General. And every time when you look at the figures that come out as fruitless or irregular expenditure, it's quite worrisome. And that is where National Treasury was coming from, to say we need to start being proactive in terms of how we do our procurement, also introducing seamless approach to the things that we need to do. And I'm taking you to the data of 2014-15 because that's when this initiative started. There was an irregular of 25.7. And when they looked at that, they decided we need to come up with reforms that will change the attacks. And the Office of the Chief Procurement Officer was instructed then by cabinet to accelerate SCM reforms by modernizing the faction. Firstly, they needed to finalize the legal framework aligned to the proposed reforms. They needed to simplify, standardize, and automate procurement activities across all fears of government and modernize SCM technology and upscaling the use thereof. So what happened is when they looked at that, they also recognized that the competency resided elsewhere. And if you, if you understand government, government's competence in terms of technology resides within CETA. CETA offers the services that are, are, are automating the government IT space. So they asked CETA to say, CETA, here's a mandate for you. We want you to help us in terms of changing our landscape and automating and digitizing the procurement system within, within the national government. And that is where I come in, is one of the projects that I was leading. So we looked into how then do we start? You cannot start from digitizing without understanding what is in existence. So there were a lot of, um, of functions of systems that were in existence, your central supplier database, your e-tender portals, your G-commerce, your national treasury integrated financial management system, which Karum has also spoken about. And those are the things that we looked into. How then do we bring in together? this together. With this in mind, we needed to come up with an integrated procurement platform that was envisaged to provide transparency and control of government pr uh, procurement while it's following a fair and equitable process. So then th there was a vision coming from the Office of the Chief, uh, Chief Procurement Officer. The vision was to develop a digitally driven, strategically focused, high performance procurement solution across the public sector, local government and state owned companies, and which eventually leads into the payment, into the payment sector. The solution needed to ensure that it is able to drive transparency, be cost effective, competitive, and follow a fair and equitable process. So any solution that is going to be responding to government in terms of the payment also needs to recognize those key elements to say it needs to be competitive, it needs to be cost effective, and it needs to follow a fair and equitable process. And what were the things that needed to be looked into in terms of source to pay integrated platform? You needed to have single data standards enabling integration and interpretation that is codification. And if you've been part of these exercises, you would have listened to some of the speakers talking about integrations, talking about interoperability, talking about all of those nice words, which are buzzwords within the, within, within the digital sphere. And those are the things that government also recognize. We needed to have standard government-wide processes and policy. And how was that going to help them? It was going to help them in terms of improved demand management, reduced duplication, better transparency and supply negotiation, wider geog geographical reach, lesser time of transaction, better pricing, process efficiency, and increased uh, compliance. 
So, so that is the vision that I've actually given there to say this is what we needed to do. We needed to leverage on the existing technology and stuff like that. And now, what was the initiative that they came up with? They came up with an initiative that was called e-commerce for government. E-commerce for government was basically, was going to be a government owned source to pay solution that is aligned to the SCM legislative prescripts that I have spoken of in support of the government wide uh, reform initiatives. That was aimed at modest, modernizing, simplifying, standardizing and automating all the SEM uh, functions across all government departments. And the benefit was to, which I've also said, fair, equitable, transparent, comp competitive, and cost effective. And I want to uh, iterate this, the reason being, this is what we're trying to respond to when we're talking payment digitization and, 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 and when we're talking about the entire uh, landscape of how we want to eventually come to a government that uh, uh, supports the, the initiatives that were coming in. Then we look into what are the challenges that we're experiencing today? Probably we even talk digitized payments, probably we even talk uh, rapid payments and everything. It was, we firstly needed to understand the limited ability to leverage economies of scale. We needed, those were the challenges. The challenges of limited ability to produce specifications that weren't an award, lack of transformation within, within the supply chain management space, long turnaround times, we've all seen how long it takes, for an order to be issued, duplication of effort, limited visibility into government spend. Most of you will not even know how much we spend in terms of ICT spend within government. There was collusion, fraud, and corruption, high cost of acquiring goods and services, lack of compliance to procurement, and hence the need to digitize. With that, the envisaged benefit was to ensure that there is improved demand planning, there is increased value for money, there's improved service delivery, this reduce cost to service, accelerate turnaround times, reduce fraud and corruption, drive innovation, and improve transparency. And I've listened to all the speakers, they're all trying to address everything that is on the envisaged benefits in terms of the solutions, in terms of the case studies they've shared with us, we're all trying to move towards a common vision. So what happened is prior you even do that, you need to understand the architecture. That, that is governing the entire structure of government. And those are the architecture. So you look into what does exist. In terms of the data sources, those are the various data sources that reside. So you need to understand to say, when I digitize payment, what are the data sources coming from? So the data, data sources are from your central supplier database, your CETA Oracle ERP, your government basic accounting systems, all those div uh, various departments, they also have data sources that you needed to look into. In terms of the infrastructure, you needed to look at the various data centers that exist. You need to look at the servers, you need to look at the network, and you need to look at the cloud computing. And I started there because if you look, if, if you've listened to the presentations that we have all had, they're talking about shared infrastructure. They shared they're talking about common uh, 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 the ecosystem that is able to leverage on each other's technologies. And for us to get there, we need to understand what are the underlying principles. Then we move over to the data management. In terms of the data management, we look into the data governance, the metadata, the master data, the data architect, the data models, the business intelligence, and the data quality. That's something, again, that we need to look at as the industry trying to address digitization of payment. We look at another layer that comes again into this is the integration layers, which you look at your ESB buses, your APIs, your web services, your ODBC, JSON, HTTP, SOAP. That's the integration layer, especially when we talk, inter we talk interoperability. Those are things that we need to understand. The private sector come into play, government come into play, other sectors come into play. That is the, the landscape that we need to operate in. And then we look at all the modules that are currently there in terms of those that will eventually lead to us having to make a payment and having to distribute payments. Those are the applications that are currently in existence. And what are the access channels? So the access channels will be your digital, will be your web, will be your portal, will be your mobile, will be your desktop, will be your kiosk, will be the platforms that Bankshap is also, Bankshap Africa is trying to come up with. And, and there's a lot, you know, there's fintechs coming up with so many things. Those will be your access channels. Then we move over to the users. Who are the users? The users will be your national treasuries, your city, your local government, your provincial government, your national, your public citizens, your supplier. We're all responding to the same, same, same people. And then what is it that underpins everything, information security and business intelligence? So that was already there and we don't need to be reinventing the wheel or anything. So what happened is now, the key questions that they ask themselves, what are the business processes that will drive the transformation? 
can standardization happen and drive efficiencies within procurement? How do we design with the client in mind? Can we simplify to ensure ease of use and encourage adoption? And this is still relevant to the current. If you look at what is happening to the current, whether you're coming from private sector, whether you're coming from government, these questions still pertain to any solution that we are bringing in, in terms of digitization. How do we design with the client in mind? Can we, see, can we simplify to ensure ease of use and encourage adoption? What is the right technical architecture to meet transformation targets? How do we ensure the technology supports the divine, defined processes and business requirements? And the reason why that is important, you're looking at the digital gap. You know, you, you're also addressing areas that do not have um, access to digital products, such as your, your technology in terms of your Wi-Fi reach, your uh, simple, simple things that we take for granted. So we need to have solutions that can respond to such. And what are the key skills and right organizations set up to transform and drive the proposed reforms? So those were the questions that we asked then and are still the same questions that we need to ask ourselves as we're talking about digitization of payments. And then where do we come in? I'm in a privileged position right now to say, yes, I've had that experience of having to unpack that for government and also coming to look into what is the e-commerce solution that we can bring. And then now I'm into the Banks of Africa and I'm looking into now this, uh, what is Banks of Africa? And I'll take you through what is the journey of Banks of Africa and how does it fit in into the landscape of making sure that whatever that is, uh, government wants to achieve, they also uh, uh, play a role in ensuring that we address the same. So Banks of Africa, for those that do not know Banks of Africa, I will take you through Banks of Africa 101 so that you do understand that it's not a profit-making organization and hence the partnership and why we can achieve this together. So what is Banks of, Af uh, Banks of Africa? Banks of Africa, its core purpose is to build digital mutual infrastructures that connect economies and empowers people. And, and exactly, it talks to what I've said about government and hence I started with the government initiative it talks about empowering people. It talks about uh, uh, connecting economies. And what it does, it, it, it collaborates in communities of members and users to create shared platforms that benefit everyone building on multilateral relationships of trust. So if you look at that, you look into when they talk about shared platforms that benefit everyone building and multilateral relationships of trust. And when we talk relationship of trust, I want to take back to Karin, from Sasa who was talking about, when we talk data, we need to talk trust. And already it's embedded within the core purposes of this, this company that most of us were not aware of. And in terms of the infrastructure, we look at the infrastructure, they focus on networks of relationships and processes that support economic activity. These include business, legal governance relationship, technological networks and systems. At the heart of digitizing payments, we're talking technological networks and systems. And that is the infrastructure that is already in existence. And how do we connect economies? Our mutual infrastructure supports competitive provision of financial services by our customers. These two support market economies, national economies, and regional economies. Of importance to me is this part, the national economies and the regional economies. So at that lens, what do they do? They, uh, through a payment, they link Africa to the world and, 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 uh, and each other through borderless payments. They modernize in payments and opportunity to drive growth and inclusion. So whatever we do, any initiative that government wanted to do, eventually it has to come to a payment. And where does the payment go? Eventually it has to be settled through Banks of Africa. So now you are seeing the interlinkage between Banks of Africa and the services that are are being offered out there and what government is trying to do. So those are the interlinkages that Kathy asked me to talk about. And what is it exactly? It is the largest automated clearing house in Africa and it builds and operates South Africa essential payment infrastructure to support African communities and economies. And I want to emphasize the word infrastructure so that we look into how do we share, how do we leverage this infrastructure that does exist. Bank of Africa is designated by the South African Reserve Bank as a systematically important financial market infrastructure. And I think what gives us comfort again is uh, government is also playing a role through South African Reserve Bank. In South Africa, we are the bank, banking sector's long-term trusted clearing partner and an authorized payment clearing house system operator. We have engaged with Sasa. You have seen Sasa also present and Sasa is talking about how they've been distributing the 350 grants Banks of Africa was at the heart of it. So, so, uh, so it now plays a vital role that was not visible to the eye of a commoner. And a commoner is those that will not have understood what Banks of Africa is all about. 
And then since 1972, which is 49 years old, Pensive Africa has facilitate, facilitated the movement of trillions of rents through the economy, enabling new markets and businesses and people to engage, transact with each other. So what we look at, it's, it's, we've look, we're looking at the banks and we're looking at where it comes in. We come in the measure. Uh, for those that are thinking, probably what is the role of the bank? Uh, what is it that is doing in here? And especially when we're talking uh, digitization, banks have is there helping to settle any payment within the Southern African borders. And, and this is just giving you, it's depicting a picture of where everyone fits in within the structures so that you understand where everyone fits in. You have your citizens there, you have your beneficiaries, you have everyone that should be benefiting from this entire ecosystem. And then you have the owners who are the banks, but you have our people and you have Banks of Africa there trying to bring all these areas together and saving everyone within this mutual structure so that everyone benefits from the infrastructure that is within the structures. So what do they offer? And what I've learned from this, they offer a digital payment infrastructure solution, extensive processing infrastructure, advanced payment system to for provide seamless interbanking, switching, clearing, and settlement. And I would want to move back to the presentation that I had. And I look into, which I think Karum has also spoken about, a few people have spoken about. And I think um, I've had also had uh, Kony speak about digital identity. Anna has written a book on digital identity, Anna Met. So you look into what are the initiatives that will, will, will support this vision of digitizing payment. You look at the rapid payments program. I've had a colleague of mine, Bishnin Kumal, who presented on it, what it needs to achieve. I will not even want to repeat that story, but the rapid payments program is basically saying, let's bring those that have been initially excluded within the banking sector into this sector and trying to bring everyone so that we all leverage from the same. And you look at the digital identity. Digital identity, we're all talking about it all areas, you're talking home affairs, they're talking digital identity, you're talking the private sector, they're talking digital identity, you're talking fintechs, they're talking the digital identity, you're talking any other area, everyone is talking, talking digital identity. How does digital identity fit in within the modernizing of payments? We all recognize that eventually we need to have a digital identity for South Africa. And how are we going to achieve that? It will not be achieved if we're going to be running fragmented uh, uh, solutions, trying to come up with fragmented ideas and everything. That's where we need to collaborate. And how do we collaborate better is something that we will have to engage as we continue with our sessions. You look at the transactions cleared on an immediate basis. Transactions cleared on an immediate basis is targeted at our African countries to say they need to be cleared. When you're doing a transaction, I think some of us are so used to a transaction being given to us immediately, but some do not have the luxury of having their transactions cleared immediately. And that is being covered. And it's another key element within the payment sector to say as we're digitizing payment, everyone wants to see his or her transaction being cleared immediately and being able to come into their transaction. And now what I've learned again is to, for them to be achieving these initiatives like we did in government, what is it that you needed to do? You don't start and say, you know what, we need to move from, from a battle straight to, to a, a jet, a private jet. You look into how then do we transition? And they transition through a program called Ukululama. How is Ukululama helping? Ukululama is recognizing that we need to move from, from where we are right now, from the legacy to, 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 the, to the latest technology. And for us to move there, it's not going to be an easy way or an easy, an easy path. We need to bring something that is going to serve as a conduit or as a bridge toward moving to a digitized platform. And that's Ukulama for you. It's a bridge that is helping us to eventually come into a digitized platform. And it will take me back to what have I learned as I look at, as I look at the initiatives that have been put by government, what we could have done better. There is a reason why I'm putting this picture together. And the reason why I'm putting this picture together is if you look at the orange part, which is in between, what, what we could have done better as government, you look into, we put in that middle part as government in terms of digitizing procurement within the government sector. But again, what we needed to look at, we need to look at the various partners that needed to play a role. And who are the various partners that we needed to play a role? How do we enable them? If you look at the vision and target of Banks of Africa, it did exactly what we would have wanted to achieve as the bank. They play in the, in the, in the, in the orange platform, in the orange uh, uh, picture that is painted. And you look at the gray areas. The gray areas is 
where anyone that can, wants to come and participate within this structure can participate. And if I look at where government wanted to go in terms of enablement of, of supply chain and other areas, is if we had to build something like this, to say we're building the orange picture and we allow other players to come in into this sector where you have your platform extension partner, you have your PSPs, you have your innovative service providers, you have your payees and everything, that digitization could have been achieved. Or, and what went wrong for us was the fact that we looked at everything and we wanted to address even the gray areas that needed to have been achieved. And that, that is something that I learned from what could have gone right within the sector, within, within the project that we're trying to, 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 to um, implement within the government sector. And how you go about it, you look into, this is the picture that I would love to say, we as government, we needed to have been the orange picture there where you see Banks of Africa automated clearing house. And then the rest are coming in with the various products that they are bringing in. And how does it fit in this picture to what we're trying to address? We're recognizing that the program that is run by Kathy with the various industries, they are playing the automated, not the automated clearing house, but they are playing the role that is played by the automated clearing house. And they should allow the other stakeholders, be it the private sector, be it any other sector, coming in with the product offering to eventually achieve the journey of digitizing the payment sector. And this is where everyone, and we're talking the ecosystem, this is where everyone comes in to play a role within the ecosystem. There is a role for everyone within the industry. There is a role for everyone in this digitization of payment. And this picture of Banks of Africa is what has made me learn that these are the learnings that I can bring and share with the platform here to say these are things that if we work together, we can be able to achieve what we want to achieve right now as, 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 um, as, as, as this program that uh, Kathy is coming up with, a very powerful program. And what went wrong? I look at what went wrong with my program when I started implementing the SCM program is we looked at reverse engineering. We looked at taking the old technology, trying to reverse engineer it. We looked into, we, we, we didn't look into compatibility and interoperability issues. We ignore the scalability and agility. And if you, if, if you were participating in this program since it started, you would have seen that at the heart of this, it's where you talk compatibility, where you talk interoperability, where you talk scalability, where you talk agility. Was government on the wrong path? It was, not a, it was never on the wrong path. Because if you look at everyone that has participated in this, everyone that needed to have played a role in ensuring that this happens. And this is what I'm trying to bring to the forum to say for us to be able to digitize and be able to come up with a digitized platform, bring, come up with a, a, a payment uh, solution that is able to address the needs of government. We need to all play a role and also look into where it's coming from, which is cradle to grave, because eventually when you come to the payment, that is when you come into the grave. And that's the story that I wanted to share with you in terms of where we are going as, as, as government and how we can partner with the private sector, having had the privilege of being in both sectors, having had the privilege of working uh, for both the SOEs, Office of the Accountant General, and now in the payment industry. And this is the journey that I wanted to share. Having said that, Kathy, I think I have covered what you asked me. I think I've covered your brief. Thank you. Thank you so much, Portia. That was an excellent presentation. Very exciting to see and some very powerful lessons learned as well for all of us, right? Um, and I like your vision of where you're wanting to go and I love your passion. So um, thank you so much for, for your time as well and for sharing your wonderful knowledge and experience. We're going to move over to William Cook, who's actually from CGAP um, and specializing in payments and financial market infrastructure as well as digital business models. So William, over to you. Great, thank you. William, I can't hear you. Are you perhaps on mute? There we go. Sorry, I was having trouble getting unmuted. Um, okay, cool. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to take a, turn a little bit to a slightly narrower um, question or conversation. Uh, but it's one that we see uh, emerging and gaining importance in, in a number of markets. And, and this is about, as we see programs, uh, markets moving more towards customer choice for G2P payments, uh, how do we need to rethink um, some of these questions around fees and incentives uh, for funds disbursement? 
And it's a slightly longish deck, so I'll make uh, I'll move through some of these slides relatively quickly, but we'll share the deck after and, and happy to take any questions. So first, just a couple of definitional sort of notes. Uh, you know, when we're talking about funds disbursement, this is acknowledging that the actual funds disbursement is only a slice of what we're talking about in, in uh, GDP. So, you know, so we're not gonna be talking in this discussion about, you know, eligibility, program enrollment, and, and all of the things that go along uh, around that. And the second is what we mean by choice. Um, so some of you will be familiar with this term from, from other contexts of, you know, we're really talking about the ability for a beneficiary to select among multiple op account options. But you really almost have to view choice as a spectrum. Uh, if you start off at one extreme, you know, you think of a market like Lebanon today, but many markets, where you have a single financial institution contracted to manage disbursement through some sort of competitive RFP. And all of the things that they're supposed to do in executing are outlined within um, uh, that contract and, and the contract enforces adherence. You move to something uh, like a Kenya model where you might have multiple banks contracted, but still through an RFP process and, and still a contract uh, in, in force to something like Zambia, uh, multiple bank and non-bank providers, uh, but they're, they're being pre-funded for disbursement. So there is a direct relationship between the program and uh, the recipient institution, but not necessarily a contract. So no SLAs around fees and, and reconciliation and so forth. To the opposite, you know, what we would consider almost to the opposite extreme of a market like India, where really the financial relationship is only with the program or sponsor bank and it's NPCI, it's, it's the payments ecosystem that is, is enabling uh, the recipient connectivity. But what we're really talking about, you know, as we move along that spectrum is the difference between sticks and carrots and how we move from contractual obligations to more of an open market approach where incentives, uh, and become more relevant in the conversation. So taking the, that same spectrum, uh, you know, if you think about the things that fees and incentives are actually paying for, you know, again, you know, it's the same activities that are going to be need, need to be covered at the FSP level in any of these scenarios. So uh, supporting payments to accounts, opening new accounts, providing liquidity in the right areas, adding access points where they're needed, Again, at the left, at the extreme, you know, all of those things in a case like Lebanon today might be covered into a single contract, a requirement to build an ATM where it doesn't exist and, and so forth. At the opposite extreme in a market like India, you, know, you need to think about what are the actual incentives that are being created through the fee structure, through alternative approaches to incent uh, the, the coverage that, that you need. And that's really a lot of what we're gonna be talking about here. I'll move through a couple of uh, through these slides pretty quickly. You know, I, I think we, you know, we've seen different, you guys have seen different flavors of, of this graphic before. Uh, just to put up the traditional single institution contract with a pre-funding arrangement, you have government uh, communicating transfer instructions to a sponsor bank and to the recipient bank, um, a bulk transfer of funds be, between financial institutions, so pre-funded. But you also have a choice model um, uh, lacking in that, that centralized infrastructure in some cases. This is like the Kenya example, the Zambia example. And the only reason I point this out is that, you know, I think it is possible to have those choice models without, you know, the, the most robust, you know, instant payment systems and digital ID and all of this. But it does obviously necessitate a much heavier lift in terms of reconciliation and, and some of the um, supporting infrastructure. And then to the classic example that you know I think I think you've a lot of you have seen before of, of something a bit more like India, where the government agency, the the program is only um, dealing with the actual sponsor institution, and then the retail payment system is taking a larger role in transferring to individual. So the only reason I talk about all of that in the context of a, a fees and incentives discussion is, is just to sort of place us in that map. Uh, you know, that middle row, the fees to the program banks, just wanted to make the point that those fees aren't going to go away in any of these scenarios. Um, so whether they're managing a, it's a single bulk funds transfer uh, and pre-funding, 
or dealing with a switch, there is going to be some level of, of overhead there. Um, it's really about the recipient, the, the fees to recipients bank and that relationship that we're talking about changing. And in particular, these two um, uh, boxes on the lower right, when you're talking about some level of choice and moving away from that single formalized contract. So in terms of starting to think about those two boxes and, and how we deal with the recipient institution, I think it's worth you know, taking a step back and thinking about the financial institution's perspective overall, because they have a series of costs, um, you know, obviously that they have to manage in supporting the program, uh, customer acquisition, agent acquisition, if it's for new areas that, that aren't already covered, and then ongoing disbursement and support costs. So things like um, account maintenance, um, customer support, the phone banks, if that's something that's going to be included uh, uh, in their purview, and then you know, agent management, liquidity, and so forth. And, th and those cost drivers get recovered in a number of ways, right? So if you're thinking of a GDP program like in Indonesia with the Huduma banks, that's uh, just the float revenue uh, of, of the, the funds that they're holding. If it uh, could be retail fees paid by the customer, that's more of the Zambia case, or uh, bulk fees uh, for, from the payer, from the program, well, as in a lot of cases. So when we start to think about the incentives and, and the ways that we can intervene and, and balance incentives as we move away from a, a single contract, there's, there's a couple different tools available. One I already alluded to, um, you know, it, as in the case of Zambia, this was really left open to uh, the market. So the market's financial service providers are charging retail fees for withdrawals, but um, there was a customer uh, cash out top up. So, so something added to the beneficiary payment that would ideally cover, you know, some version of tra uh, travel costs plus um, the cost of one withdrawal. And you know, whether this is an incentive is, is a little bit a matter of perspective, uh, right? Uh, so so you know, whether the beneficiary is, is receiving 97 net or 100 net or 103 net, you know, their behavior of, go, of having the, a sufficient incentive to go and withdraw those funds is probably not going to change. Um, but I, we're seeing in a number of markets where it is relevant in terms of the broader um, uh, political question of you know, making sure that the intended amount for a beneficiary is actually capable of reaching uh, them, even if it isn't the case that they're going to withdraw it all in, in, in one um, go. So if you think about something a bit more like a Kenya, um, you can think of customer onboarding incentives as another tool. So actually paying per beneficiary onboarded and potentially even tiering uh, those fees based on the, uh, how rural the area is, how difficult it will be expected to service a customer in that area. Uh, but this also raises new questions. So you know, how does the type of organization or KYC requirements, you know, if it's an EMI versus a bank and so forth, impact uh, the, the, the level of the incentive? And then also, um, you know, the extent to which you're actually varying those incentives based on region and, and how. You can imagine something similar on the liquidity side. Uh, we haven't seen an example of this in practice, but in the same way that you're thinking about at a customer level or, or a beneficiary level, um, an incentive, you can imagine a scenario where you're instead thinking about uh, liquidity. You know, what is the size, what is the uh, cost to service a particular agent location or region uh, with that liquidity and how do you ensure that it's getting there? And then a little bit larger scale. So, so you know, once you start to think about you, a lot of the, the last couple of slides I was discussing were around these marginal incentives. So. Um, you know, if there is service in an existing area, but, but not sufficient with liquidity and, and so forth. But once you start to talk about more rural areas where there isn't otherwise a business case for a provider to establish a locate, an active location in that presence, then you enter a little bit uh, different conversation that's a little bit more long-term. Um, so public investment subsidies in, in, in distribution. 
And, and really that's where this, this GDP incentives conversation becomes very much intertwined with a broader market building one. If you think of um, uh, markets like China, like India, a lot of that rural access um, was you know, done through wider scale programs, things like PMJDY to, to ensure access to accounts. Going hand in hand very much with G2P uh, programs, but, but a little bit uh, dotted line uh, connection. A, a little bit more tightly uh, bound is, is if you think of a market like Colombia. In, in Colombia, uh, the uh, GDP program sponsor and the government uh, actually ran a, a co-investment scheme um, to, for a period of the first three years to absorb some of the costs um, uh, th that were required to establish access points in those more rural areas. But again, in, you get into very much a, a broader market building conversation and a little bit long term, more longer term than with the previous. So we've been talking a bit about this difference between you know, easily serviceable and not easily serviceable and remote. Uh, so for the last few minutes, I just wanted to cover a little bit of how we're thinking about some of that segmentation. This is just illustrative, um, but you can start to think about how this might break down between segments, geographical areas of primarily active account holders, versus areas that might be easily serviceable, so, um, but not currently serviced in, in, in a heavy way. So uh, mo recipients not having accounts, but most having access to mobile phones or, and or uh, living near access points and, and so forth, not easily serviceable down to the remote um, where there are fundamental barriers to, to account access. And again, just as an example uh, of this and some of the questions that we've been asking to try to segment uh, geographies a bit in this way. And <laughs> this is just to note that, you know, this may go without saying, but uh, not as a single measure within a country or perhaps even a region, but really, you know, thinking about distance relative to FSP hubs, like, you know, where, are the, where is the liquidity? Where are agents um, finding that liquidity? And how do we measure out uh, from, from those sorts of access points? So this is an example of how we've uh, looked at this in, or applied this framework a bit in Indonesia. Um, you can see examples of the four layers here. In a region like West Java, you might have a beneficiary access ratio, as you can see, around 44 uh, to one. But then you go down to uh, a region like Papua, that benefit, that same ratio is looking at something like 6,000 to, to one. So how do you start to think about fees and incentive structures in a way that uh, adjusts for um, uh, those differences? And again, this is just illustrating the same. So Selatan, West Java, you can see primarily active account holders, easily serviceable, Papua, a little bit of a, of a different conversation. In the context of Indonesia, um, you, you, this is uh, what's being proposed as a fee structure uh, uh, right now. And you can see how this tiering has played out in practice. Um, this has not gone live yet, so uh, we don't have results on, on this as of yet. But this is an example of how um, Indonesian authorities are thinking about these types of concepts in, in application. And then just uh, 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 almost to last note here, um, where different types of incentives obviously then uh, apply differently as we think about these re regions and geographies. So a customer cash out top up, a liquidity incentive, it's going to be relevant um, anywhere, even in relatively easily serviceable areas, um, you know, depending on the size of the GDP disbursement, the frequency, you're going to have a, a lump of liquidity or, uh, moving through and, and, and how do you accommodate for that? Customer onboarding incentive, obviously less relevant where uh, there's a predominance of active account holders, but, but more relevant as you move out. And then this, this longer term discussion around public investments and subsidies, obviously more relevant to, to where there isn't already sufficient incentive for providers to enter. Okay, so just wrapping it up here. Um, so a, a few takeaways that I would say from this. 
One, that customer choice is about giving recipient options. So if you boil down all the complexity of that spectrum and everything that, that I was presenting, it's fundamentally about moving more towards market-based approaches, more towards general use accounts, and, the and away from clawbacks, away from these things that, that allows a customer to um, treat it more like their regular financial account and, and all of these long-term financial inclusion benefits that we want to see. But along with those new benefits, there's also challenges because as you start to move away from contracts, as we said, that, that surfaces new challenges, especially around ensuring coverage for the most uh, rural and least accessible areas. For areas that might be within that margin uh, of accessibility for existing service areas, that means finding economic models to encourage the behaviors we wanna see. So these incentives that, that we started to talk about, tiering fees. For areas that aren't already serviced, the, the most rural of rural, um, Sudan is, is, is a good example of this. You know, If you have 10 to 15% of people with active accounts, mostly in Khartoum, lots of areas where you can't even access by road, um, then it's a little bit different conversation and it becomes much more entwined with this mar broader market building. How do you think about moving um, services out in the long term? Cool, I, I will pause there. Thank you very much, Will, for that. Um, some added layers of complexity on additional things to think about when you design G2P systems, you know, and obviously choice is a very important one and certainly a very relevant one for South Africa. So thank you very much for those very interesting comments. Jason, I see you've got your hand up. Time to turn on my current. Uh, there's some, I think there might be something wrong with my camera today. Um, just want to make a comment. Uh, the chat function doesn't seem to be working. It seems to be disabled. Okay, we'll sort that out. Thanks for letting us know. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the one question which I do, I have a couple of questions. Um, earlier question was for Portia uh, and my second question is to William. Um, but let me start with one for William. Um, in your model and in the studies that you looked at, um, you spoke a lot of the incentives for uh, the, the various participants or distribution network. And I'm wondering if there's any kind of indirect incentives and examples where indirect incentives are actually leveraged. So in, and where I'm coming to is around say, a retailer that's also acting as an agent realizes that, look, I can actually provide or make this um, to for someone because I know that person may likely come and shop and buy stuff. And there's, there's this whole customer journey within that whole time. So you're actually completing an end-to-end -end journey. And I'm wondering how can indirect incentives basically be built into such a, um, into these models, yeah. Yeah, so it's a great question. I, I would think of indirect incentives in a couple of ways. I think one is from the opposite side of the value chain, like I was alluding to, program, you know, government taking a role in things like mandates. So um, China, India approach, programs like PMJDY. But I think more specifically to what, what you were mentioning at the retail level and, and uh, fully digital, you know, digital transactions, merchant networks, we've seen this tried in a number of markets. Um, I, I think it becomes a bit of a targeting question as well, though, because for um, depending on the population that you're targeting, if, if it's really a social support program, if you're dealing with beneficiaries who live primarily in a cash economy, um, it, it's going to be a pretty steep uphill climb to try to achieve fully digital transactions. It, it, it's a much different uh, like quantum level of effort um, around you know, these kind of financial inclusion sorts of behaviors. Great question, Jason. Do you want to ask Portia your next question? Yeah, sure. Um, my question to Portia is... Can you just speak a little louder? Um, sorry, I just want to check if I'm connecting. I might have some problems with my Zoom. We can hear you. That's oh, okay. Fine. Yeah. Great. 
yeah um my question is to answer ask Portia around were there any considerations in her experience um, looking at both the accounts receivable as well as accounts payable so that to drive usage at a government level around the e-government services um, and when she was uh, engaging with them around. Uh, so it's beyond just supply chain management. It's also about how do we make sure we standard create the incentives or usage, digital usage for both a, at an accounts receivable perspective. Um, thanks, Jason, for, for the question. So, so these programs that there's two programs. There was the e-procurement program that was the, driven by the office of the chief procurement officer. And your question now will reside within the integrated financial management system that was driven by office of the accountant general. So it was to address the uh, account receivables and your ledgers and your uh, account payables. So this was simply to just address the procurement deficiencies which eventually will flow into the integrated financial managers, manage, management system, which I've not spoken about but Karum did highlight a bit of it. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, thanks so much for that question uh, and answer, Portia. So we're gonna move on to Carol, who's actually going to give us two more case studies. He is actually a financial sector specialist um, who is also at the World Bank and that. And uh, over to you, Carl. And you'll be presenting Bangladesh and Poland. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, let me just share my screen here. Oh, just one sec. All right. I, I think that's. Uh, we're fine. I uh, hope you can hear my, I uh, hope you can see my screen, right? Uh, yeah, it's perfect. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll try to be uh, very quick to leave some time for Q&A and subsequent discussions. Uh, but uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, as, uh, as Cathy said, uh, Bangladesh and Poland uh, in the context of government to person payments and pass into to government, government collections. Uh, uh, so uh, let me start with Bangladesh and then I'll, I'll move on to Poland. So the context as far as Bangladesh is concerned is that it's been a country that's got historically uh, some issues with financial inclusion. Uh, account ownership, so uh, account ownership uh, and usage of financial services was pretty low. But at the same time, uh, there was a pretty high penetration of the market by mobile money providers uh, and uh, similar PSPs. So to give you a comparison, perhaps to our South African audience, uh, it'll be a better one. Uh, the number of mobile money agents in Bangladesh is comparable to the one in Zimbabwe. So this is sort of a similar market saturation, market development moment. Uh, however, uh, those uh, entities, uh, those uh, uh, mobile financial services providers, uh, as they call them, mobile money, basically, they were not historically tapped into in the G2P context. And the second thing to keep in mind is that uh, social safety net payments have always been very important for Bangladesh almost since uh, the founding of the nation. And it's been ever increasing. So uh, just uh, the programs funded uh, by our uh, foreign donors run into a few billion dollars a year, and that's uh, all pretty large in the country context. Uh, so the journey that uh, Bangladesh uh, embarked upon started with really trying to tap into uh, the state-owned institutions as delivery agents to a bunch of these programs. 
Uh, so there's, uh, historically uh, speaking, there's been a, the Bangladesh Post Office that was an important actor in any sort of uh, payments uh, delivery, especially to remote areas. And uh, a number of largest uh, banks in the country, such as Sonali or Rupali banks, they were also state owned. Uh, so at the very beginning of uh, the journey, and that was around 10 to 15 years ago, uh, the idea of the government was to predominantly uh, make use uh, of the uh, state-owned uh, state financial institutions as a sort of delivery architecture, starting with a post and moving uh, to the state-owned commercial banks. And uh, under the leadership of Bangladesh Bank, which is the central bank of the country, uh, Bangladesh uh, tried to push both the post and state-owned banks to innovate uh, and to deliver some of the financial inclusion products, such as the so-called one taka accounts, so accounts without any minimal balance that were uh, provided by a number of state-owned financial institutions and so on. Uh, the bottom line, however, is that it had not been terribly successful. Uh, so um, moving back to the drawing board, uh, the country started looking into uh, leveraging those ever-growing mobile, uh, mobile money providers as delivery channels uh, for the payments. However, the, one of the bigger problems was that whereas uh, the banking system was well integrated into the national payment system in the country, so all banks, both private and state-owned, were part of the automated clearing house. The country moved to an RTGS, uh, and there was also a national switch supporting domestic uh, ATM and POS transactions. Uh, the uh, um, the mobile money companies uh, were not quite part of that ecosystem. So eventually, unfortunately, uh, the whole ecosystem moved to um, ad hoc payment delivery contracts that Will spoke about in his uh, presentation with essentially um, uh, the um, single social safety net program and single uh, ministry just uh, picking either through a procurement contract or just uh, or getting um, some exemptions from public uh, or procurement rules and just uh, contracting through the means of direct negotiation, but contracting a single payment provider that was supposed to uh, deliver wallets or accounts to the recipients of those program or benefits, make sure that there were plenty of agents available uh, where those people lived, where they could uh, withdraw, cash out their balances and get compensated for it uh, uh, by the government, by the ministry, according to the negotiated uh, rates. Um, that wasn't very conducive uh, to uh, competition and to the development of the financial sector, because, of course, it was, in a sense, crowding out uh, rather than crowding in private investment. So um, the government and the central bank, uh, motivated by the COVID-19 pandemic, tried to go back to the drawing board and think about some better ways of uh, or going about it. No, unfortunately, there has not been that much of a difference uh, in terms of market incentives and market structures, because uh, when it came to uh, the government's emergency benefits delivered, as well as uh, a salary payment program for uh, or ready-made garment industry workers, which is a very large share of uh, employed in Bangladesh, um, they came uh, together. Uh, they came together with an idea of, of essentially creating a cartel of sorts. Uh, so there was a, an agreement between all the mobile money providers in the country that they're going to sign a master contract with the government 
uh, get the same remuneration for each benefit transferred, but there will be the market will be uh, divided between those uh, three or four entities in a top down way. So company A is getting 1 million beneficiaries. And once you hit 1 million, you can't uh, enroll anymore, uh, goes to company B and so on and so forth. So unfortunately, because that was a model that did not facilitate uh, competition or indeed trade and private investment, the results were mixed. On the other hand, the beneficiaries of the programs uh, all, uh, describe their user experience as something superior to what was uh, before with cash-based delivery or, or, or just uh, getting some sort of ad hoc uh, contract with a post or a commercial state-owned commercial bank. On the other hand, uh, they were not really uh, financially included in the long run. And once the program uh, stopped, uh, their uh, beneficiaries started withering away. And moreover, there was some concern about some ghost accounts, so to say, being created uh, as opposed to real people being re reached. So there's still, uh, the jury is out and the stakeholders in Bangladesh uh, are still debating as to what the next step should be. Uh, there is generally a consensus that the long-term delivery model should be something more similar to the one applied in India. However, there are some issues uh, with cost sharing and who is going to pay for it. One thing that I wanted to uh, indicate, though, as an important step was the changes in the financial infrastructure. So as I mentioned to you beforehand, uh, the non-bank payment system providers were essentially cut off from uh, the main payment systems, clearing houses uh, run at the national scale by the central bank. This is still the case to a large extent. However, the central bank decided to introduce a quick fix of sorts by connecting uh, the leading mobile money providers to the automated clearing house in a sort of one directional way. So the connection works for disbursements from bank accounts into mobile wallets. And it was done in a sort of ingenious way with some manual changes in uh, the ACH software uh, where basically um, uh, mobile money providers and PSPs uh, were deemed as a sort of virtual branches of the responsible banks, and therefore they have been given an ACH branch code, and therefore that sort of facilitated uh, the disbursements uh, of, of uh, um, benefits, pensions, and so forth. Uh, through the ACH in a sort of straight through processing way, at the same time at a fairly low cost without the need to uh, go too much into uh, the new, the procurement of, of new software or onboarding them on a completely new switching infrastructure. On the person to government angle, uh, that historically was even less developed uh, than the G2P infrastructure. So it was really every single biller on the government side uh, was fending for themselves, most often in a sort of similar manner uh, as to what I described before. They were handled, the collection was handled by one of the state-owned commercial banks uh, that usually ran sort of agencies or cash endpoints or at the locations of, for instance, passport offices or electricity uh, or water utilities where people could pay in cash. At a certain point, those banks, those partner banks, 
uh, started uh, providing some digitization of those collections. However, uh, it was mostly only possible for customers of that particular bank. So Desco, for instance, the electricity utility for Dhaka and surroundings, uh, they had a uh, contract uh, with a with the, the billing contract of a single bank and customers of that single bank were able to pay for their electricity from the internet banking portal, but it was not extended uh, to the users or to customers of any other banks. So the Ministry of ICT decided to move towards more of a have and spoke model and launch a portal called ECPAY. Uh, EC is basically one in Bangla, uh, which uh, was supposed to be the one-stop shop for most of government collections. The development was contracted to uh, a private IT company, but it is currently operated by the ministry. And in a sense, in a sort of commercial terms, what's important here is that the Ministry of ICT holds the master contract with all sorts of acquirers, mostly um, private banks, as well as uh, a number of uh, PSPs and mobile money companies. And so uh, any sorts of negotiations on cost sharing uh, and the contracts happen centrally, whereas uh, for line ministries, local governments, and any other uh, entities from the public sector, uh, the ministry provides an API uh, that allows them to integrate their billing system into the collection of flows and uh, or handle sort of cost sharing in-house uh, with the Ministry of ICT without the need to engage uh, the payment service providers or acquirers directly. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the use cases are still somewhat limited. So uh, there's utility payments, fast food fees, school fees, uh, railway tickets, uh, but uh, most of the tax collection is handled uh, through different means, mostly because there are some uh, amount limits or uh, transaction limits on retail payment infrastructures and usual tax and customs duty bills exceed that uh, and therefore require an RTGS uh, wire transfer. Moving to Poland, uh, it's a fairly interesting case, I should say, because uh, whereas it did not have much of a challenge on the G2P front, basically the European Union through its PAD, Payments Accounts Directive, uh, required all banking institutions to offer free basic banking accounts with a basic bundle of services such as uh, a debit card or access to internet banking for all the people who were unbanked and therefore uh, the issue of delivering accounts to the people is handled through regulatory means rather than any sort of contract for the provision of account services with PSPs. Uh, but it's been uh, quite a challenge on the collection front. And it was an interesting case of public-private collaboration where it was the industry that mostly took charge and brought different stakeholders together in order to get the collections, particularly of small amounts like traffic tickets uh, or, or small local taxis and fees uh, digitized. So um, we should start by mentioning that the country ran a program called Cashless Poland since 2015 as the initiative of Visa, MasterCard and local payment, uh, local bankers associations. That was really motivated by the fact that the country was still lagging behind its neighbors when it comes to cashless payments acceptance. Um, and at the same time, payments were becoming in the low interest rate environment, uh, quite an important revenue stream for banks. And therefore everybody saw bringing more merchants on board, 
uh, as quite an imperative for the whole sector in order not to die. So uh, the program uh, was funded by banks and PSPs. Uh, there was an independent foundation created to facilitate uh, those subsidies. And the program uh, basically subsidized the purchase of up to two POS devices and all the uh, merchant discount rates for the duration of uh, two years for small and medium merchants. And when I say subsidized, it was a 100% subsidy. So both the POS terminals and the MDR, uh, MDR were completely free. Um, so the government payments innovation here is uh, that uh, after a while, the foundation decided to pitch to the government the same model for digitizing uh, the government collections. So basically they looked at the government and decided, okay, there's another merchant, slightly different than all the other merchants, but it's another merchant that we need to get on board. And so the foundation uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Finance, which basically extended the eligibility uh, for the cashless pool and program subsidies to all the public sector entities. More recently in 2020, it was extended also to uh, the revenue collection agencies. And as a result, uh, sort of the same idea, so two years of free POS terminals and free MDR was extended uh, to, to government entities. And as a result, most of the local, uh, at least you know, in urban areas, most of local government moved to digital collection. However, there's also uh, another aspect to that, which is uh, interchange incentives. I don't know if the slide is very well visible. Uh, it's, it's pretty small print, but as you can see, both leading uh, card networks agreed uh, to reduce very significantly um, uh, the interchange uh, charge on government transactions. Uh, where basically it is, first of all, capped, but second of all, public administration offices, um, uh, as you can see in like the second to last row on the left in Visa, uh, had uh, basically the, 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 the interchange capped at a notional rate of, of one cent, essentially less than one cent uh, in, in our uh, MasterCards uh, capped it a little bit higher, but it is uh, still a very, very low interchange uh, compared to uh, the regular, uh, regular interchange uh, environment uh, in uh, the EU. And this is something that happened in some other neighboring countries as well. Uh, so as a result, there is a sort of sense that uh, public sector agencies can feel more comfortable about uh, getting on board with those collections, as uh, it is unlikely uh, that it would require a long-term financing commitment uh, from the end. The memorandum, the form of the memorandum of understanding also allowed uh, um, public sector entities uh, to sign or uh, acquire a contract uh, without uh, worrying about uh, the, the sort of need to uh, create tailor-made procurement procedures for uh, PSP and acquisition services, which was uh, another uh, sort of good point, uh, important for a local government treasurers uh, and other public financial management officials involved in the process. I have another slide uh, on India, but in the interest of time, since that was already something covered by, by Will, I'm just going to skip it. Uh, so uh, in summary, uh, essentially the conditions of the markets uh, determine uh, where you want to go with public acceptance programs. And to an extent, uh, government, although it's a very special category of a merchant or payment initiator, is still a merchant. So often existing solutions for digitizations in other sector could be adopted uh, to the needs of the government 
and therefore the digitization of the whole ecosystem accelerated. Very happy to take any questions or otherwise move to the discussion. Thanks, Carol. That's quite fascinating and just shows the complexity of the challenge we're dealing with. Um, but it's clearly no walk in the park. Um, I don't see any hands or questions. Um, don't see anything in the chat. I think with that, can I just ask our speakers if they can just turn on their um, cameras? So, um, Carol, Karam, Andrew, Jeresh, Ishmael, and Portia. Like one rose amongst all of the gentlemen here. And um, great. So we're actually going to cover some of the questions. Please post questions and also feel free to comment and ask questions to your panel. Um, I'm probably going to, um, if you can just pop up to, um, as some of the speakers must really talk, um, if you can just pop up their CVs and that so that we can actually um, just get a little bit of their bio just initially, and then um, we can just sort of move on. So um, my first question is to Andrew, um, really around We've seen quite a few case studies around, you know, government to person payments digitization and also in Karam's presentation, it comes across quite strongly, which is you can see that whole suite of services. If you look at the layering of um, services that are offered, if we start to think about, as Portia put it, cradle to grave or end to end um, digitization across the entire value chain. So we know that in different institutions and uh, or in different countries and the different case studies, sometimes um, the central agency that drives a lot of the digitization of payments in the public sector sits with the presidency. Other times it's with the Ministry of Finance or the central bank in some instances is often driven by the Department of Social Development. So having looked at the South African landscape and also heard what Kurama said, which is really about who has the convening power to actually do so, your thoughts on who would be best placed to actually drive um, digitization of payments in South Africa and be the anchoring department. Hello, Cathy. Well, I, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but uh, it is striking as one listens to the experience of other countries that nobody's really tried in our context. So we have, uh, uh, SASA and the Department of Social Development, which over many years has made progress in strengthening its centralized payment system. Uh, 20 years ago, there were nine provincial payment processes. Uh, there's certainly been a considerable uh, uh, progress over the, uh, over the last couple of decades in moving from cash to accounts, but that's not complete yet. Uh, there, as you know, has been movement between uh, sort of arrangements with uh, uh, private uh, payment providers, uh, the post office and, 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 and bank accounts. Uh, but the, the Social Development Department and SASA have essentially undertaken this within the ambit of their responsibilities and not in collaboration with other parts of government, parts of the social security system, which also have payment relationships with, uh, with beneficiaries. So the unemployment insurance fund has its own arrangements, the compensation fund, which is overseen by the same department, has its own arrangements. And uh, 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 Treasury, uh, I think we have to say, has really been missing in action in the consideration of these arrangements. They get involved in the discussions with SASA or with the Social Development Department in when, when, when changes are made to arrangements or when the costs associated with uh, contracts are under consideration. But that sense of a central place that brings together the various uh, uh, agencies of government that have payment relationships with, with individuals, uh, that sense of a central agency in government playing that role is, is, re is really missing. And I think that uh, if, I, if I may say this, Portia, you know, your presentation in, in some ways illustrates where Treasury's priority has been. It's been with relationships with uh, the business uh, uh, service providers to government, 
uh, 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 rather than the, uh, uh, the, the, the coordination of uh, payments arrangements with individuals. I, I'm sure I don't know everything that's been under discussion in government, so obviously there's more to what uh, 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 to, to this context than, 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 uh, than, than, than I'm covering here. But I think uh, you know it's it, I think the time is right for uh, certainly the finance ministry and the treasury, but in association uh, with a number of other departments. And I would emphasize the Department of Employment and Labour and the Department of Social Development because they have large payment relationships with uh, individuals and families and, and, and households. I, I, I think the time is right for an initiative that brings those three ministries together with uh, uh, with the central bank, uh, with the organizations that represent payment providers, uh, the payment association, the banks themselves, of course, uh, uh, to talk about how we take this forward. Uh, there is, uh, this is an environment in which the existing networks of payment arrangements uh, the mar in, in, the, in the market, the banking systems, but uh, also uh, the, ro the role of mobile providers, uh, uh, the, 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 mar the market developed institutional architecture for payments arrangements is, uh, is quite mature. Uh, and so there certainly is scope for government to take advantage of the extent of innovation, the extent of investment that has already been made in in, uh, in 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 payment networks, payment systems, uh, to uh, bring greater certainty and lower costs uh, to to these uh, uh, to, to 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 these payment pr processes in future. Uh, so I think the time is right for for centralisation. I, I I I'm not going to say where the coordination should be. Uh, it clearly has to be the treasury. Clearly has to be an important part of part of that. But I also would want to say that the uh, that the Treasury's tendency to deal separately rather than in coordination with the central bank and the bank's central bank's relationship with, with, with banks and other payment providers needs to be overcome. They need to be very much part of the discussion uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and really only uh, in that way will it be possible to sort out the balance between competition issues and coordination issues, which as was illustrated in uh, perhaps particularly the, uh, the, the Bangladesh case, uh, really need to be thought about through carefully if one is to get an optimal outcome. Thanks, Andrew. Duresh, some of your, you know, um, experiences, I mean, being at GTAC and also having worked with the UIF, you know, as Andrew mentioned. Yeah. Look, uh, just to pick up on what Andrew is saying, I, I do think that the Treasury has an important role to play in uh, in uh, you know getting the initiative off the ground because it is actually in their best interest to do so. I mean, it has a public finance responsibility, and we've seen that uh, you know in the instances where I've been involved in in the UIF most recently, where uh, you know we've had instances of false inclusion and false exclusion, where people who should be paid were not paid and people who shouldn't have been paid got paid and uh, we can't have the, that continued so you know it's clear that there needs to be an initiative there needs to be some uh, you know uh, cross departmental uh, gathering where we try and figure out uh, how to deal with some of the problems but I do want to raise the issue of you know what is what is the problem that we're trying to solve because in we shouldn't rush off to try and create a centralized agency before we actually understand what the issues are. And you know, the, the issues are, for, for instance, the lack of our ability to verify who the beneficiary is. And that's why we haven't been able to pay some people you know, correctly. And so uh, we need to figure that out and we need to see, uh, are we resilient enough? Because COVID has shown us that uh, We've had to scale up payments tremendously at certain points and then drop you know, significantly at certain points based on uh, peak. Uh, it's interesting how the UIF TERS payments has actually followed those uh, COVID peaks. And uh, so we need scalability in, in the systems and we need resilience in the system. So I think, you know, 
uh, what are the fundamentals? We're trying to make sure that we get uh, the right people, uh, you know, paid the correct amount uh, on time and into the right bank account. And so how do we work backwards from there, uh, you know, and to make sure that it's easily accessible to people as well? How do we work backwards to ensure that outcome? So I think, uh, you know, that's what we, we, we need to think about. You're up to, back to you, Cathy. Thanks, Teresh. Um, Portia, I mean, you are much closer to this and sit, have been in, you know, various parts of government um, and also now sitting, you know, bank serve. I mean, you know, your thoughts, I mean, I think Teresh's point, you know, and Andrew's, you know, this is the right time. Treasury is a missing player. I mean, we know that. Um, and we sort of experience a lot of the challenges with the Treasury around some of this. But, you know, your experience having been in the Treasury and perhaps a reflection on something, you know, Kuram had said earlier on, which is the link to the IFMS system, how payments have to be integrated into IFMS. And I think, you know, the big missing piece is we don't have a government to person payments module in the IFMS system. You know, we've got payroll, we've got, you know, procurement, but what about that piece? Um, so your thoughts around that. Thank you, Kathy. And I want to agree with Andrew to say when you, within the system, you tend to look at uh, solutions differently and addressing a certain uh, problem instead of addressing it holistically. And now that I'm on the outside and I look at how we could have done things differently, I think, yes, you're right. Um, we also need to appreciate the strength of each area. Treasury needs to play uh, a, a legislative role and a guidance role, while it's at the same time we recognize that there's a South African Reserve Bank that interacts a lot with the banks and everything. And also the key players within the industry that we never considered. So we look at the solution in fragmentation. That's what we did not address in the bigger picture. And that's what Andrew alluded to, to say th that's what Treasury will do. But if I had to step back, I will say, Yes, I, I believe that for me, Reserve Bank plays a central role in bringing all the key stakeholders together because then they will be able to bring in, you look at what is happening right now, they're able to bring in the SASA, pro, the SASA into, into, into discussions with the banks, with Banks of Africa, with everyone. They're taking a leading role. And if you look at what we're trying to address, I believe that at the, center, at the heart of this, Reserve Bank is the one that can play a leading role in ensuring that we achieve what we want to achieve and Treasury playing the legislative role. Thank you. Rams, your reflections on what you've heard, um, you know, especially from a centralization and, um, you know, a convening authority. Um, you know, it's, it looks like from the case that you presented, it often sits under the Ministry of Finance, um, sometimes a central bank, but we have seen sort of presidency playing an important role. Um, just reflections on, you know, Aside from just convening power, we've seen from Bangladesh things can go horribly wrong, you know, and you can have a lot of those things in place. Um, so just some thoughts on some, some things we should be mindful of when we're thinking about um, something like this. Uh, Kathy, so, oh, sorry. sorry. Sorry, I missed it. Is it for Portia? Yes. Okay. Portia, please go ahead. Yeah, my thoughts, Kathy, is exactly what Andrew addressed. We need to look at the key stakeholders within the sphere and appreciate where each competency lies. You know, what is the competence of the presidency? What is the competence of the uh, of, of, of treasury? And then we try and bring this together, bringing uh, the other key stakeholders within this. You know, your private sector, your private sector actually takes the cue from government, from the government policies. They cannot even be deviating from it. Whatever that they put in place, they are guided by the government policy. So let's allow government to play in the policy role. Let's look at the presidency bringing that, but there should be a central body that brings in all these elements together to be able to achieve this. Karan? Yeah, Kathy, I just want to actually unpack some of the issues that we have been discussing. When I'm saying centralizing, I am not saying that uh, taking away the legal mandate of the various agencies. So if there is a social protection agency, so that social protection agency still has to do the enrollment. It still has to do the eligibility determination. It still has to do the payment processing. Similarly, a payroll agency responsible for the payroll, another agency responsible for the pension. These agencies do keep their functions as is mandated under the law. What I am talking about is the common infrastructure. Right. 
So in order to, the problem Dhiresh mentioned, what is the problem that we are trying to solve? The problem is duplicative investments, silos. So if every agency is using e-payment, for example, then maybe a central agency can do the convening role and uh, have one common infrastructure that can be used by everybody. And then when we are talking about the e-payment, I think we need to keep separate boundaries. There is an e-payment system where within the government that treasury controls and that's where IFMIS comes in. You, know, you manage cash, you manage budget. But then there is a payment switch that is controlled by the central bank. So this is the relationship of the central bank with the payment service providers or the commercial banks. So that should, obviously that should remain with the central bank. Uh, so the, the common infrastructure pieces, which I have seen uh, that, that, that are duplicative are interoperability, for example. Does every agency need to have their own interoperability platform? And there could be a centralized interoperability platform. E-payment. Uh, uh, then you have a portal, for example. We have seen in many countries, every agency has its own portal and then they have their own mechanisms for. So in modern architectures, governments are moving towards a single portal. So then, the, so I'm considering the role of the agency in the context of where there are, there are common infrastructures. Uh, and then the agencies keep their functions. And then where the, what I have seen is that in some countries, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, these, some of the technological pieces like portal and interoperability, they sit with the ICT ministry. Yeah. What I have seen is that ICT ministry does not have a convening power. So ministries, even if they have something common, people use their own whatever autonomy and then they have duplicative investments. In Austria, for example, they have a common uh, platform for artificial intelligence. That is under the common agency, the central agency. So now if any agency wants to procure an artificial intelligence platform, as per law, they have to submit the proposal to this agency. And this agency shoots down the proposal, says that we already have an artificial intelligence platform. We will not provide you the budget to avoid the fragmented investments and you know, proliferation of various platforms. So that's what I was saying. And then uh, in that context, that agency that has a convening power that can bring people around the table and they people listen, that is where the effectiveness is. And then uh, typically this ministry is Ministry of Finance. Pe people listen because they have to get the budget from the Ministry of Finance or the president, of course, or the prime minister. In many countries, it is under the office of the president. Uh, in US, for example, GDS is under the office of the cabinet. So that's uh, that's the distinction that we have to make. The decentralized functions uh, keep where they are as per law, but the centralized function could be under a central agency where there are uh, problems and potential risk for a duplicative investment. You can do the common infrastructure to save cost and then do the convening for the coordination. Thanks, that's actually very useful and, and helpful. Ishmael, coming to you, um, what kind of a government structure you know, would you think of um, when you think about digitization of payments? And um, you know, having been in government and being in the private sector as well, uh, what do you think the role of the private sector is? So we've seen quite a few examples where you know, the private sector does take over some of the functions or is supporting government. We see a lot of public-private partnerships, et cetera. Your thoughts around this? Uh, Kathy, thanks. So I, so I think from a, from a governance perspective, I think, I mean, there are different models that you can set up for, for governance. And the objective, of course, is to try and understand what we're trying to achieve. Um, if the governance is really about making sure that all ministries participate, you know, timelessly in the in the required activities. You might have one structure. If the governance structure is really more around setting standards, policies, uh, getting the enabling legislation in place, uh, setting clear accountabilities, um, setting some data standards, then I think you might come up with a slightly different governance structure. I I, I think Andrew's point was quite valid in terms of where. If you have to create this agency, uh, and I think for, uh, Kuram Farooq actually stated it quite nicely as well, he said, 
the core line business of the different ministries, whether they're in labor or in the uh, socials, uh, SESA or any of the others, Department of Housing, have these payways to be done. That's the core business. I mean, otherwise you remove the core business of those ministries. What we're talking about here is almost the last mile. But in the last mile requires lots more to be done. Uh, and I think in the last mile is where you start coordinating and checking for eligibility, duplications, uh, triplications. And we've heard a lot about digital ID. Um, and my, my view would be that we, we have kind of a digital ID already in place by the Department of Home Affairs. Yes, it's not flawless, and let's not pretend that it is flawless by any chance. But it's only when we start coordinating between ministries that we begin to get the kind of information we're looking for and coordination. I think the other part that's very important here is that there's no real sharing of data between ministries. Um, you know, so UIF has got a mandate and it'll do whatever it needs to do. Um, you know, it won't go and check necessarily with the treasury whether this person is sitting on a payroll, uh, you know, uh, as well as claiming a UIF benefit or, or whatever it might be. It, it's just to understand that those hooks need to build. I think finally, in the governance arrangements, you're also trying to achieve one thing, and that's the end goal. And it was quite eloquently stated, uh, I think by Georgina some time ago, is that we're trying to create a better experience for the beneficiaries from government. It's not that government's not paying, but it's, it's improving the whole experience. So uh, citizens then rely on government uh, and they know that when the money is due, it will be there. I think one of the reasons we see people withdrawing the funds always from, from their accounts or their wallets or whatever it might be, is this kind of trust issue that maybe government will pull it back if I don't spend it in the next seven days. Uh, and, and we need to get through, through that as well in, in the process. Yeah, I think the last mile, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Ishmael. No, so let me, let me pause there. Uh, okay. I think the last mile is an important one. And uh, Carol, sort of your views on, on last mile. Um, I, I found your uh, first slide in Bangladesh quite fascinating, you know, where you talked about um, large scale sort of uh, interoperability, uh, lots of like, you know, mobile money, but very low financial inclusion. Uh, and I, I think it's an experience in South Africa as well. Um, actually, all SASA beneficiaries are banked, strangely enough, but uh, just the large majority of them, actually, as soon as they get paid, actually draw their you know, money out almost immediately. So they never really use any of the financial services that are available. So they're not saving, et cetera. So just sort of some reflections on that. And I know you spoke a little bit about the incentives on that, but maybe your views around you know, financial inclusion and, and the last mile. Uh, certainly, certainly. So I think that's uh, one lesson from, for instance, Bangladesh experience is really rather than uh, to design uh, the payment process from the top down and just start with the assumption that, OK, we're going to use the government bank because that's what we do. Uh, let's perhaps start uh, with the experience of the beneficiary. And there's uh, many methods, you know, the sort of service design tools, uh, customer journeys, et cetera, that uh, allow us to look through the lens of the beneficiary and sort of uh, start the design of the process in that way and see what exactly there is this kind of bundle of financial services uh, and so, um, uh, products that can be relevant to that actual population of, of those beneficiaries. The second thing I would add here though, is uh, it's also uh, useful to try to think about how we can make the relationship between the beneficiary and the financial institution more meaningful so that they are actually perceived as customers in their own right, rather than some sort of offshot uh, of the uh, contract with the government, which is the customer. But one thing which I didn't mention in my uh, uh, a slide on Poland, but it's a, a, an interesting example of that thinking uh, is uh, through the shared ID infrastructure, banks were actually uh, uh, enabling the application uh, for social benefits to be integrated into their own IT systems. So often you could actually apply for a social benefit on the um, 
uh, on the bank's website or on the bank's mobile app and open your account simultaneously. And that would be the account uh, where you would be receiving that uh, benefit. But the key here is because the workflow, the kind of uh, customer journey involved that financial institution from the get go, there was more of a sense of ownership of the process on both the side of the beneficiary and their financial institution, rather than the attitude that we've seen in many cases, uh, where the idea is, you know, you get the money out and then forget about it because those people are just not your prospects. So I'm thinking about really trying to look through the lens of the beneficiary, try to uh, envision what bundle of services is really something that would make sense for them, uh, and then try to tie them uh, more closely to whatever financial institution you pick as your delivery agent. You also have a question in the chat, which says, uh, it's from Jason again, in Poland, what role did instant payment play in promoting digital acceptance or collection? Uh, so uh, I'll be frank, uh, not that much. So the, the acceptance, the full acceptance journey uh, happened well before uh, faster payments got into the picture, which in Poland, as in many other European countries, were first very much uh, 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 confined to the P2P use case, and only then uh, started uh, kind of venturing out into the merchant acceptance. So they, they um, initially, and I would say uh, right now, it's still the vast majority of uh, government collection use cases uh, that either RTGS wires or mostly card payments, either face-to-face -face or with card not present online transaction. There is a sort of layover service built on Poland's faster payment infrastructure called Blick, which was actually part acquired by MasterCard recently. And this is a sort of uh, uh, acceptance solution built upon the faster payment, the instant payment rails. Uh, it is popular in uh, commerce and, and, and sort of business merchants. Uh, it is starting to get embraced by government so, uh, acceptance agents, but it's still at a fairly early stage. So I would say it's kind of mostly really driven by the cards, uh, either in sort of physical or in tokenized form. If we can just go for another five minutes, um, if that's okay, um, I'm just going to sort of last comments on that. So, Andrew, maybe just some comments on the interface between social security re and retirement reform when we start thinking about sort of the centralization or, or a central switch, particularly, and switching through a central point, some of the economies of scale that could exist there. Well, just uh, a pretty obvious point is that I think in the next phase of work on the social security reform, and this is about you know social development's own work and the, and our Department of Employment and the, the UIF particularly, um, there needs to be a lot more engagement with the private sector because the, uh, the 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 pensions industry itself has the challenge of uh, reaching lower costs through. Uh, shared standards and possibly uh, a shared platform, possibly even collaboration with the UIF and SARS as a collection agency on behalf of the UIF, you could easily add a collection of a pension contribution in a standardized way onto that that could go to the uh, retirement funds that administer those, uh, those, 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 those pension plans on behalf of employers. Uh, the private sector has an interest in bringing those costs down and taking advantage of the, 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 the reduced risks, the greater certainty uh, and, uh, and continuity of relationships between uh, the savings institutions and their clients that, the, that a social security fund would have. And so we're likely to make the most progress in this area if we do it in a collaborative way, if we make the institutional developments in a collaborative way between the public and the private sector. Thanks, Portia. Sorry, thanks, Portia. Your views on data interoperability and the challenges, I mean, you showed us a map, a minefield actually, 
of institutions and, and data sources. So, and that's clearly a big, you know, key, you were talking about it, you know, collaboration, data interoperability, et cetera. Okay, um, th thanks. So, um, data interoperability, I think uh, Karen from Sasa spoke about it. You've also spoken about it. And it's the complex, complex, complexity of the various data sets that needs to be managed. But my view is, Let's, let's, let's let the data reside where it needs to reside. And then we get to a relationship of trust where we're able to share the data. And my reason being, if we've got to centralize the data and we get to be attacked, it becomes a problem, especially now in terms of cyber security. So I would rather have data reside where it needs to reside. If Sasa owns the data, let it be. If Bankself owns the data, let it be. But we share and we agree on various sets and we build an agreement of trust. Thanks. I think it comes back to Karam's point, right? It's not about it being centralized in one place, but it's about the infrastructure or central infrastructure, which allows traffic between institutions. So where the authority lies or the mandate lies, let it reside there, but let us ensure that the platforms allow for interoperability. Um, Yuresh, your views a little bit about data interoperability and some of the challenges that you've experienced, you know, from the UIF side and, and sort of the importance of communications in that space as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, what I, what I had said about inclusion and exclusion earlier on, uh, you know, it really, it really all rested on, on interoperability and the ability to verify. So, you know, some of the issues that came up was, you know, we were paying people in prison. Uh, we were paying people who manufactured, uh, you know, IDs and data. There wasn't a, an easy way to ID uh, or to verify people's IDs and, uh, you know, uh, across the government system. So uh, it's not, it's not automated. There had to be lots of communication with the Department of Home Affairs, with the Department of Education, with the various departments to try and organize access to those databases to be able to do that verification. And that is a huge problem because we shouldn't be in that situation. Those databases uh, should be easily accessible by whichever government system wants to pay a beneficiary. So whether you're paying a beneficiary in a community work program or any one of those, uh, in, you know, uh, uh, government uh, employment schemes or uh, whether it's the UIF, the systems need to talk to each other to make sure that, you know, you, you're not double dipping in the system and that you actually are entitled to, to the amount. So, uh, you know, interoperability is a key thing. And uh, if you, if we can, uh, agree within government about the organizing framework to ensure interoperability between systems, that would be a major stake in the ground. And I think that's something that we, you know, that we should try and get uh, going as soon as possible. Cathy? Thanks so much, Tarish. Ishmael, any last comments from you around, you know, just general comments, particularly around last mile centralization? <laughs> Yeah, no, look, I think uh, what Duresh says is absolutely true. And I think I, I've covered that uh, a bit earlier. But this thought I have is that, you know, we want to digitize payments. What about digitizing the citizen yeah. and really empowering the citizen, yeah, uh, to be able to apply for these things, you know, via their digital devices, uh, whatever they might be. Um, and, and then we need to have the safeguards and the controls in place so that the right person gets the right benefits at the right time, you know, every time. Um, I think also centralizing the payment has possibly an unknown, uh, well, probably a, a, a benefit in that it probably gives the, the treasury a better control over the total cash flow and when the cash flow is required. And I mean, we shouldn't underestimate the, the, the amount of savings that generates just in timing that at the right point in, 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 in time. And, and I think the, the last part for me is really, as fintechs come on stream, I mean, you're going to find more and more platforms, you know, for payment and whether it's the, the mobile platforms at the moment, the digital wallets, uh, all of these things. I don't think so that payment is kind of fixated to one specific uh, grouping and that being the banks, uh, you know, in the country. We should be, be aware that sometimes the reach is not there. I mean, you take the post office with the number of branches they are closing, there's often no reach, you know, for the poor citizens that are sitting in very rural areas. 
And so we need to we need to think about these things as we go forward. Thanks, Cathy. Thanks so much. Um, I think with that, we're actually going to to wrap up today's session, I'd just like to remind you that our next webinar on the 17th of November is going to focus on what we've been talking about, beneficiary-centric design. So how do we put the beneficiary at the center of our design and wrap services around them? As I mentioned, we've got the IFWG, the inter the the Intergovernmental FinTech Working Group Hackathon. That's coming up on the 1st of December and we're very excited about that and we're very grateful to our FSCA colleagues for all of the work that they've been doing. And then on the 15th of December, we've got the Integrated Databases for Coordinated Social Service Delivery. Um, with that, I would like to thank Karam for your wonderful insights. Um, Carol, Will, for your presentations, and Portia, thank you so much. And then to our guest speakers, Andrew, Duresh, Ishmael, uh, thank you very much for your time and for participating in our webinar. And I look forward to seeing you um, in two weeks' time. Take care and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.